Good evening, I'm Andrew Chang. Adrian is away. Tonight, we track two decades of deadly encounters with Canadian police. Taking my daughter's life, that was, there was no justice in that. What the numbers say about the relative risk to black and indigenous people. We have identified at least five sections of the Ethics Act that Bill Morneau has violated. Tracing what we know about Bill Morneau's connections to the WE chair. What you're doing is hurting us. Why families of victims of an April rampage in Nova Scotia don't like the way it's being reviewed. And the remarkable journey of one COVID-19 survivor. That was your last memory. Last memory until I woke up in ICU approximately almost two months later. A story his husband worried he wouldn't be able to tell. This is The National. Halfway through the year, 2020 is on pace to be the deadliest in two decades when it comes to Canadian encounters with police. We've seen about 30 such deaths annually in recent years. This year, there have been 30 already. That's just one finding in our CBC News project, Deadly Force. Now, we created a database because there is no official count anywhere else. We checked sources, including court cases and media reports, over a 20-year period. And tonight, two stories highlight two key takeaways. One, that black and indigenous people are overrepresented in deadly encounters with police. And two, that most of the victims had mental health or substance abuse issues. Now that is where we'll start, with the story of a Mississauga, Ontario man shot dead by police in June during a mental health crisis. The Fifth Estate's Mark Kelly spoke to his daughter. It started with a call for help. It ended with a man shot dead. Ajaz Chaudhry was schizophrenic. His daughter called the Peel Regional Police non-emergency line, hoping paramedics would help her agitated dad. From all I can remember is cops after cops after cops arriving with guns just out. Like, it's one frail 62-year-old man who is in crisis. Nimra says her father feared police. He locked himself inside their department. The tactical unit arrived. He was stunned with a taser, shot with rubber bullets, then shot dead. The tactical team should not have been called. There was no need. Even the police officers were unnecessary. This was not a criminal. This was someone in a mental health crisis that the paramedics and social workers should know and probably do know how to deal with. Since 2000, two thirds of people who died in encounters with police struggled with mental health issues, substance abuse or both, according to the CBC's research. Criminologist Scott Wortley says data like this is a critical tool to hold police accountable. When we get broader statistical uh, information that are, are documenting these patterns year after year after year, it's much more uh, uh, difficult uh, uh, for uh, police officials and politicians to just turn their back and say that uh, um, you know, these allegations are unfounded. 2020 is shaping up to be the worst year in decades for the number of Canadians killed by police. Nemra Chowdhury wants to be a social worker and be part of the solution to a growing problem. The best thing I would say that me as a 19-year-old sees in the future is us growing up and taking charge and like changing the way things are. Mark Kelly, CBC News, Toronto. Now that case is being investigated by Ontario's police watchdog. Today, we learn the officer who fatally shot Ijaz Chaudhry is refusing to be interviewed by the Special Investigations Unit, and he won't submit his notes either, nor can he be forced to. Nine witness officers have been interviewed. Now to the other key finding of our research now, that Indigenous and Black people were overrepresented in deadly police encounters. Cameron McIntosh has more on that angle. So there's been a lot of support. Will Hudson's pain is ridden on his truck in a call for change. I could do whatever I have to do to try to get uh, to be heard and be noticed out there. In April, his 16-year-old daughter, Aisha, was allegedly involved in a liquor store robbery in Winnipeg. That led to a chase, ending with police firing shots heard in this eyewitness video. Taking my daughter's life, that was, there was no justice in that. Hudson says his daughter was wrong to have been involved but insists she should not have lost her life. The gunshots happened way far too soon. 
The shooting is under an independent investigation. Winnipeg police aren't commenting. When Hudson was killed, she was one of three Indigenous people killed in confrontations with Winnipeg police in a period of 10 days. The CBC News study of fatal police encounters shows Indigenous and Black people disproportionately represented compared to their share of the overall population. The Canadian Police Association is pointing to poverty, violence and addiction in marginalized communities as aggravating factors. If we don't get to those broader um, underlying societal issues that cause this, then your data is never going to change. I think in, in many of these instances, the police are justified in using the force that they did, but we need to look at the greater circumstances. Akwasi Owusu Bempa is a sociologist specializing in race and policing. As Canadians, do we want to see our, our, our black population, do we want to see our indigenous population dying at the hands of a state agency? Manitoba Grand Chief Arlen Dumas says attitudes need to shift. I have seen the direct results of, of giving people hope and, and uh, giving people an, an opportunity to, to go down in a different way, and that's not necessarily militarizing your police forces. Hudson's father believes racism is prevalent in police culture. Cops should have had more training, should have did more things to, to prevent this. He's not waiting on any investigation to demand change. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg. And we have much more of the Deadly Force project online. You can head to cbcnews.ca slash deadlyforce to see the full database. You can filter cases by race, year, or location and read some of the 555 case profiles. So there are several late developments tonight on a story out of Ottawa. It involves allegations of a toxic work environment in the office of the Governor General. Ashley Burke broke the story earlier in the week. She joins us now at the latest. Ashley, what's happened? Well, late this evening, the Privy Council office released a statement confirming that it will conduct a third party review of harassment claims at Rideau Hall. In a statement, PCO said today it initiated a thorough, independent and impartial review to examine the concerns raised by past and current employees of OSGG. Harassment has no place in any professional workplace. It is a public service priority to advance efforts to more effectively prevent and resolve issues of harassment. Now, this is in response to our story Tuesday, in which a dozen sources described a toxic environment at Rideau Hall and a culture of fear that, bel that, that involved belittling and berating employees to the point where some have been reduced to tears or have left the office altogether. And Ashley, is there any word out of uh, Rideau Hall on this? Well, behind the scenes today, sources said the atmosphere at Rideau Hall right now is heavy and it's tense. The office arranged a virtual meeting with the ombudsman and employees today in light of our story. And just tonight, we heard from the Governor General, Julie Payette, for the first time since the claims were published. In a statement, Payette said, I am deeply concerned with the media reports regarding the office of the Governor General, and I am completely committed to ensuring that every employee who works at Rideau Hall enjoys a secure and healthy work environment at all times and under all circumstances. I take harassment and workplace issues very seriously, and I'm in full agreement and welcome an independent review. And you'll also note there, Andrew, she did not deny the claims. Mm. Okay, thanks, Ashley. Ashley Burke with breaking developments tonight. Okay, let's turn now to the wee charity story dogging the Trudeau government. The Conservatives, already calling for Finance Minister Bill Morneau's job, now want him to face a second ethics investigation. Evan Dyer shows us how we got here. We have identified at least five sections of the Ethics Act. Five, six, 11, 21, and 23 that Bill Morneau has violated. He as much as admitted it yesterday. Bill Morneau's admission that we paid $41,000 in vacation expenses for his family has made him the main target for the opposition. In the summer of 2017, my wife and my daughter Claire traveled to Kenya to learn about WE school projects. That trip in June 2017 was one of two the Morneau family took with WE that year. In December, the family traveled to a WE project in Ecuador. I expected and always had intended to pay the full cost of these trips, and it was my responsibility to make sure that was done. Morneau now acknowledges that wasn't done. We paid over $41,000 to cover the family's costs. Four months after that trip, the Morneau family gave $50,000 to WE. Beginning in April and May this year, officials began to discuss the possibility of putting WE in charge of the student's summer grants program. Morneau's office was involved in those discussions. Then on June 19th, his family donated another $50,000 to WE. Six days after that, the government announced that WE would administer the program. 
Canadians don't believe this minister. It's not the first time Bill Morneau has failed to disclose assets or benefits. The trip to Ecuador came just weeks after the ethics commissioner ruled against him for failing to disclose the ownership of a villa in France. Today, the Commons Ethics Committee voted to call the Prime Minister to testify, the second committee to do so. He's already agreed to answer questions from the Finance Committee, but hasn't answered this latest demand. Evan Dyer, CBC News, Gatineau, Quebec. Canada's top military commander announced today that he is retiring. General Jonathan Vance has been chief of the defense staff for more than five years, during which he took on the issue of sexual misconduct in the military and saw his troops involved in more domestic roles, including helping in long-term care homes hit hard by COVID-19. In a letter posted online today, Vance said he will step down within months. Well, let's talk about COVID-19. The acting health officer of Ontario's Niagara region says he is disappointed by new videos showing people ignoring safety recommendations. Today, the mayor of Niagara Falls sent so-called ambassadors to greet tourists. They'll be squirting sanitizer into visitors' palms, selling masks, and reminding them about physical distancing. Now, scenes like that have led a doctor in British Columbia to seek an injunction requiring masks in indoor public spaces. B.C. had 30 new coronavirus cases today, which is still far behind Quebec's 142. Alberta reported 114 new cases, Ontario 103. And across Canada, there are more than 5,200 active cases of COVID-19. Now, throughout the pandemic, there has been an outpouring of gratitude to those on the front lines, healthcare workers, grocery store clerks, truck drivers, just to name a few. But as Tashana Reed tells us, some of those very same people say they are being denied services precisely because of what they do. It was ICU nurse Hinda Hassan's first week off since this pandemic started. She booked an appointment with a chiropractor and massage therapist, but shortly after arrival, she was turned away. It was a little disappointing and, and you could see there was a huge uh, informational gap. At the clinic, Hassan filled out a COVID screening checklist, identifying she has contact with COVID-19 patients, wears PPE on the job and has no symptoms. But the clinic told her they can't treat her unless she does a COVID test. I thought that was crazy because what reassures you? Because if I go have the test today, tomorrow I go back to work, then what? According to Ontario's Ministry of Health guidelines for health care providers, Hassan should have been able to receive treatment because she wears PPE during exposure and had no symptoms. If you needed my service, I can't say, hey, you're high risk, I'm sorry, I can't take care of you. Uh, but then here you are, you're denying me those rights. Clorox weights. So so yeah, you're... tons of those. Long-haul truck driver Bob Haynes has run into issues too. I can't even go see my doctor. My doctor won't even let, see me. Haynes regularly travels to the U.S. and says he can't get a doctor's appointment and his wife's dentist cancelled a recent appointment unless she isolates for 14 days. I would like to see them uh, treat us a little more fairly. The Canadian Trucking Alliance says it's looking into how widespread the issue is asking truck drivers to quarantine for 14 days before they get medical attention is quite frankly unacceptable. The Royal College of Dental Surgeons says unless the person is in need of urgent care, some patients can be asked to do a test or isolate. As for Hassan, the health clinic apologized and updated their protocol for health workers. She plans to rebook. Tashana Reed, CBC News, Toronto. Well, the pandemic has sent millions of working Canadians to swap the office for a space at home, but that has cost them money. So now, as Aaron Saltzman tells us, some want the Canada Revenue Agency to see if they can get some of that money back. When office towers emptied and more than 3 million Canadians started to work remotely from home, they also took home some of the costs associated with that work, costs that can be claimed on your taxes. The office supplies that you're consuming, the ink toner that you're consuming, those are deductible. Depending on the situation, you may also be able to deduct cleaning expenses, utility costs, even a portion of your rent. In order to claim those deductions, you have to have a separate home office and use it to meet clients. 
or work from home at least 50% of the time. Your employer also has to certify that working from home is a condition of your employment. With my little office set up here and ready to go. Karen Atkinson, a social media manager for a home brewing supply company, was sent home to work in March. But she says her employer won't sign a tax form stating that. As far as he was concerned, it was not a condition of my employment that I work from home. Some in the tax business want to know if the Canada Revenue Agency will still require employers to certify work from home during the pandemic. And they've also asked the CRA to reconsider the 50% minimum time mandate, given some won't reach that when calculating over the full tax year. I would expect if the Canada Revenue Agency does provide a concession that we will have hundreds of thousands of employees across Canada making a claim for home office expenses where in normal circumstances they would not. At this point though, both the CRA and the Finance Ministry say they have no plans to change the rules. Aaron Saltzman, CBC News, Toronto. Well, in the United States, the pace of new coronavirus infections continues to surge, as does the number of deaths. For the third straight day, the virus killed more than 1,000 people across that country. The total number of cases has now surpassed 4 million. But more concerning perhaps than the sheer size of that number is how quickly it's rising. A quarter of those cases were detected in just the past 15 days. Florida is one of the hotspots. It was also supposed to be the site of the Republican National Convention next month. But as Katie Simpson tells us, the president just abandoned that plan. Saying he's trying to set an example for the country, the president is calling off one of the biggest political events in any election year. So I told my team it's time to cancel the Jacksonville, Florida component of the GOP convention. We won't do a big, crowded convention per se. It's just not the right time for that. Florida was set to host the Republican National Convention, where thousands had been expected to watch Donald Trump accept the party's nomination, a moment he would use to rally his base amid his slumping popularity. But with roughly 10,000 COVID cases reported in the state nearly every day this month, Trump says a big gathering just isn't safe. I just felt it was wrong, Steve, to have people going to what turned out to be a hot spot. You know, when we chose it, it was not at all hot. It was free. And all of a sudden, it happened quickly. It happens quickly. And it goes away, and it goes away quickly. It is not accurate to say COVID goes away quickly. Cases are exploding in the South and West, and the country is still experiencing major testing delays. We've been here for nine hours, and these fine folks have been here longer. Trump's decision comes after he held a disappointing rally in Tulsa last month. Turnout was lower than expected, physical distancing rules were not enforced, and local health officials now say nearly 500 COVID cases are likely linked to that event. The Democrats already announced their Milwaukee convention would be scaled back and most events will be held online. We know that we are still in the first phase of the COVID-19 crisis um, and out of an abundance of caution, the Democratic National Committee has taken these steps. Trump had very badly wanted the convention to go ahead as planned. The cancellation of in-person events like it is an acknowledgement of a crisis at hand. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. Two U.S. government watchdogs are investigating the conduct of federal agents in Washington, D.C. and Portland, Oregon. It comes after another round of violence last night in which Portland's mayor was tear gassed. <laughs> Demonstrators have been protesting since May against racial injustice and police brutality. Democrats in Congress welcomed the investigations. The Transportation Safety Board has completed a preliminary analysis of the black boxes from Ukraine International Airlines Flight 752. Because of international laws, officials can't share specific information just yet. They need consent from Iran, the country leading the investigation. The jet was shot down by the Iranian military in January. All 176 people on board were killed, including 57 Canadians. The police in Nova Scotia are into its third day searching for this man, Tobias Doucette allegedly assaulted his common-law spouse Monday night and stabbed a police officer. Anyone who has any information should contact the RCMP. 
Well, the Saskatchewan Health Authority had a message today for the family of a man who took his own life after it failed to take him in, saying bluntly, we failed him. Here's Bonnie Allen on what happened and what the family wants now. 20-year-old Samuel Ugo was known for his big smile and fast feet on the football field. I need help, bro. I need help, bro. So this cry for help from inside a Regina hospital surprised his friends and family. I, I need help. But he did not get it. For this, I am deeply sorry. The Saskatchewan Health Authority says Ugo was improperly denied care at the emergency department. As an organization, we failed Samuel. Not because of one specific thing that happened, but because of multiple factors that converged and resulted in denying him care. Ugo's uncle speaks for the family. He says Ugo was visiting relatives in Regina when he suffered a mental health crisis. And he would tell them, like, I have voices in my head. I hear voices in my head. People coming after me. So early on May 21st, Ugo's cousin dropped him off at the Regina General Hospital. Ugo had to go in alone because of COVID-19 restrictions. Late morning, a doctor wrote him a prescription and a referral, then released him. At 5 p.m., Ugo called 911. A police officer escorted him to hospital, but there was a dispute over his name, so hospital security kicked him out. A couple hours later, his body was found in Wascana Lake in the middle of Regina. The honest truth is we spent too much time trying to obtain his identity and not enough time focusing on his care needs. A critical incident review did not find any direct link to racism, but the Health Authority CEO concedes racial bias could exist in the system. Ugo's family accepts the apology but wants systemic change. We told them we will work with you to make things better because we don't want any family, anyone to go through what our family went through. Recommendations include improving access to emergency psychiatric treatment. There will also be a coroner's inquest into Samuel Ugo's death. Bonnie Allen, CBC News, Regina. Well, baseball has returned with an opening day like no other. It's a tremendous thing psychologically for our country. Up next, why it's a whole new ball game and what it means for the players and the fans. Also, a look at the Olympic Games that should have been. We cannot do anything about this. And I just thought, like, I don't really want to sit around and cry about it. How Canadian athletes are pushing through this new reality. Plus, surviving COVID-19. I started feeling dizzy and just not well. That was your last memory. Last memory until I woke up in ICU approximately almost two months later. One man's months-long journey to recovery. We're back in two. Baseball's back, but fans aren't, at least not in the stands. So to heighten the home viewing experience, Fox Sports is going to digitally project them there, complete with team colors. Sign of the times. But even all of that is far from top of mind for the Toronto Blue Jays. They're not allowed to play in Canada given cross-border COVID-19 concerns. So they're still looking for a place to play their home games. For the other teams in the league, though, whose homes are south of the border, baseball's return serves as a happy distraction, though one that comes with a political twist. Salima Shivji takes us to the field in Washington. The Washington Nationals are National League champions! What was a normal celebration less than a year ago, now simply jarring to see. This is the new normal. Hand crowd cheers replacing real fans in the stands. Nearly four months after this exhortation from the president. We have to get our sports back. I'm tired of watching baseball games that are 14 years old. America's pastime is back to Donald Trump's delight. It's a tremendous thing psychologically for our country. But oh, what a difference. For the players, no touching or spitting. No getting up in the face of the umpire and masks all around. Even with COVID-appropriate fan wear, access to the stadium is strictly controlled. Reporters are stuck outside and play-by-play -play commentators will often be calling the games, watching on a screen, just like the fans. Installing new screens are also part of the adjustments for this bar, steps from the stadium. The new rules are clear, appropriate distancing measured out. Still, the owner has mixed emotions. 
We tweeted out this morning almost a plea for people to not come. Um, we have an occupancy of 335. Uh, today we're going to seat about 62. And so, you know, financially it's disastrous for us. Even though as a fan, he's happy to see this back. Um, it gives us something to do other than worry all day long, which is kind of where we've been for so many months. Every single player on the diamond took a knee for the Black Lives Matter movement. But worries over COVID-19 are clouding the season's late start. The Nationals recruited the nation's top health expert. Dr. Anthony Fauci threw the first pitch of the season slightly outside, soon after getting some advice from a Nats player who's not playing because of the virus. I'm quite nervous about it. <laughs> okay, well, don't worry about it. If you bounce it, there's nobody there to boo you. Nobody there watching for some time yet. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Washington. Okay, when we come back, how Olympic athletes are training through a pandemic. I'm going to tether off and do some stationary swimming. Um, so this is how I'm training for Tokyo in quarantine. What it's been like to put those Olympic dreams on hold. And Canada's chef de mission on navigating all the uncertainties around Tokyo 2020 plus one. We'll be right back. Well, this was not the extravagant ceremony Olympic organizers had been planning for the 2020 Games. Instead, one lonely lantern in a dark and empty stadium marked another year to go. The Games delayed thanks to COVID. One single athlete dressed in white represented hope for Tokyo 2020 plus one, as it's called. The occasion was also marked with some of the venues hosting events lit in Olympic colors. Now, without COVID-19, images of Olympic hopefuls would have been plastered across Canada for months. Now, they're in the middle of a mental and physical reset. Not to mention the challenge of training during a pandemic. Devin Haru has some of their stories. A couple of my teammates and I have turned to biking to practice. And honestly, it's been pretty great. Finally, able to train again. Hi. <laughs> trying to make the best of what has been somewhat of a nightmare. Thank you, Jill, for making sure our boat is super clean. Things look a lot different now just to get on the water. But all of this, a small price for what the payoff could be, another chance to qualify for the Olympics. Three, two, one. After the Tokyo Games became a moving target. It was very surreal. I started seeing the writing on the wall and it kind of it almost felt like a weird like dream. It kind of happened so quickly. The bodies are quiet in and out of the front. For rowers Jenny Casson and Jill Moffitt, the postponement of the games changed their lives, but not their goals. We cannot do anything about this. And I just thought like, I don't really want to sit around and cry about it. But it definitely was hard at first to switch that mindset. But the Canadians have moved through into the lead. Uh, Jill Moffat looking over her shoulder, just motivating herself for Jennifer Casson. The pair was one race away from qualifying for the Games. A successful year cut short. Canada, who finished second. Australia. Even next season, still up in the air. It's essential when everything is so unknown. It's so important to stay positive and whether or not the... This, the season next year is concrete. It's just sort of be like, yep, it's happening, and that's what we're working towards. We have the boats that are stored inside with a limit of two people in the boathouse at once. New All challenges and cleaning protocols and aside, they're determined to use the year ahead to their advantage. On an Olympic day, you want to be the fittest you're ever going to be in your life, and that's what we were tailoring our bodies for, right? So now it's like, well, I guess that was the baseline, so we're going to go up from there. <laughs> it's looking kind of great. It is great. Yeah. For Mark Smith, it's a summer of slow drives with his wife, Anne. No real place to be. Can't be living in the valley. A stark contrast to the life he had mapped out. Each morning that I wake up, I think about where we would be if the season were actually happening. Tomorrow, we'd be taking the bus down to the Olympic Village Instead, his first summer off in decades, a radical but strategic choice he made for all of his athletes as a head coach of Canada's women's softball team. And Canada will walk their way off to Tokyo, Japan. 
Last season, they qualified for the Olympics, a sport that hadn't been part of the Games since 2008. National Team Canada! And they were eyeing a golden performance. When we did our fitness testing, we had 89 personal bests. You know, we had to be the fittest softball team in the world, bar none. And then the legs are cut out from under you. Trying to keep the team together in the early days of the pandemic, Mark ran a training camp for his players spread across North America virtually. Oh my God, that was amazing. Before breaking for the summer, that was meant to be their big moment. It took a little while for us to get our head around it and to give ourselves permission to grieve and go through the roller coaster of emotions you feel when you've worked so hard for something and then through no fault of your own it's been taken from you. Just checking in to see how things are going. I know we talked a week or so ago and you were getting back into your lifting and going to do some throwing. Um, so just trying to be strategic in, um, in the way I throw through my strengths while trying. One of the things as coaches we speak to athletes about all the time is controlling the controllables, which means worry about the things that are within your control, such as your nutrition, your rest, your strength and conditioning, and your technical skills training. And I think those things really reinforced for our players that we're on the right path, we're doing the right things, we have to stay the course and be patient. Canada leads. If anyone knows about patience, it's Brent Hayden. I was retired for seven years, and the time off that we're taking to take care of this pandemic, there can come a lot of positives out of that. Representing Canada, Brent Hayden. At 36 years old, he's done this all before. Coming down now, Brent Hayden. Brent Hayden captured bronze in 2012, retired. Under the wall, it is so close. Bronze medal for Brent Hayden. Then pulled back to the pool last year. I had done a lot of inner searching and I just determined that, um, you know, deep in my heart it was something that I really wanted to do and I believed it was possible. So I'm going to tether off and do some stationary swimming. Um, so this is how I'm training for Tokyo in quarantine. Already on an unconventional path to the games, little did he know he'd be granted an extra year. He took it in stride. It's a unique time to be an athlete. You know, here we are trying to train at the level that we want to be able to train at in order to be the best in the world, but there are just so many uh, restrictions. So training quarantine day four, and this is what it's like every single morning. Have to show up and line up, and then we're going to get our symptoms uh, checked. If there's anything Brent has learned throughout the course of his career, we all have our own lanes. It's that an athlete has to do whatever it takes to get to the wall first. Flexibility and improvisation, key components to success. Accepting this new reality, part of the game now. What would your competition want you doing? What would your competition want you to be like right now? And it's like, oh, it's the biggest wake up call you can get because I know what my competition is like and they would be thrilled if we were moping around. So instead, they push in solidarity with those they plan to beat whenever the start gun finally fires. Devin Haru, CBC News, Toronto. A three-time Olympic champion, Marnie McBean, was supposed to be in Tokyo right now. She is Team Canada's chef de mission for the 2020 Games. She joins us now. Hi, Marnie. How are you doing? Andrew, I'm doing great. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks for being here. So, so listen, for, I mean, for some of the athletes, I, I really get a sense that this is so much more than just a delay for them, that, th that they feel like this is an opportunity that you, you can't get back in a way. How, how would you describe it? It is, uh, it's, it's heads and tails. You know, for, um, for, for everybody, the air, the oxygen left the room in March when uh, we, Canada said they weren't going, when it became an IOC postponement, um, all the Canadian athletes quickly absorbed the fact that there was a, a higher call of duty to lower the um, curve. But then eventually we, get all, we all get back to our lives and they're trying to figure out how to maximize this situation, how to use it to their best um, advantage without uh, burning themselves out too early. Like it's, 
it's a, it's a very complicated time uh, emotionally and physically for our entire team. Well, and, and with a, a one-year delay, I mean, even the question of which athletes get to go to the Olympics, I mean, that is a complicated, complex question, right? Because some athletes have, mm -hmm. have qualified, punched their ticket, and others are, are still fighting to earn their spot. Oh, definitely. That was some of the big concerns um, at the moment. I think I think that was what stalled the IOC from actually saying postponement when Canada jumped to it is, um, you know, something like 50, 53 percent of the athletes had qualified for the Olympics, which meant 47 percent were just moments away, days away um, from uh, punching, punching their ticket to knowing to be able to turn to their family and going, yes, mom, I did it. I'm going to the Olympics. Um, and so what we needed to wait for was all the different um, international sports federations to come up with a plan. And they were all sitting there going, well, how do we come up with a plan when there's no international competitions going on? Nobody can fly anywhere. How do you get to international points when you can't compete against somebody? Uh, so the sports are slowly trying to figure out uh, plans now and coming up with uh, new qualification plans for Tokyo 2020 plus one. Right. Um, but it, it, it is really hard for an athlete because usually they're, they're focusing all their training. They know they have two important dates, the date they qualify for the games and the date they compete at the games. And everything else is, is just uh, noise in the process of, of trying to get to the Olympics. Well, uh, cl clearly it, it is a difficult situation that, that's still very much unfolding. And so I hope we'll have many more opportunities to chat about this. Marty McBean, thanks so much for taking the time. Thanks. And still ahead, Nova Scotia launches an independent review into that province's mass shooting. But here, why family members say that doesn't go far enough. And later, he was the first one in the ICU and the last one out. What he wants you to know about the coronavirus. Ever since 22 people were killed in an April mass shooting, their loved ones have demanded a public inquiry. Today, Ottawa and Nova Scotia stopped short, announcing instead an independent review. Now, Tom Murphy explains why that decision has left families deeply disappointed. For months, there have been calls for a full-blown inquiry into the handling of the mass shooting. Today, this. The governments of Canada and Nova Scotia are launching a joint independent review of the April events. To be An independent review, not a public inquiry. It matters to the families of the victims who feel an inquiry would get closer to the truth about what went wrong. We want a public inquiry and we're not giving up until we get one because they're trying to hide stuff and we want to know what it is. What you're doing is hurting us by not giving us what we asked for. They're mad and still raw from that fateful day in April when a gunman traveled 150 kilometers shooting 22 people dead after brutally assaulting his own common law partner. The review will look at the role that intimate partner violence played in the lead up to the shooting. The gunman's access to firearms and the fake police car he was driving. And it will examine the police tactics and decisions made during the shootings. People wanted independence. They wanted transparency, they wanted accountability, and they wanted impartiality. Um, those are the same core attributes of an inquiry. This legal expert disagrees. They're getting none of that. All of these proceedings and the evidence is going to be in secret unless it happens to be revealed in the final report. There is no power to compel people to testify in open court, as it were. So the argument goes, public scrutiny of evidence about, for example, why police did not use the province's central alert system during the shootings may be limited at best. The ministers insist a review is the fastest way to get answers and recommendations implemented sooner. And some of the hearings might be held in public. A final report will be released to all in August of 2021. Tom Murphy, CBC News, Halifax. Well, after the break, one COVID-19 survivor shares his story. 105 days. A long time. A look at the unprecedented toll of the virus and his long road to recovery. That's next. We want to introduce you now to a British Columbian doctor who ended up a coronavirus patient, spending more than 100 days in intensive care. The fight took a lot out of him, but he shared what voice he had with our Briar Stewart.
It's been two weeks since Greg Phillips came home from the hospital, several months since he was first rushed there. I have to concentrate on swallowing. Phillips, who was 59, was his hospital's first COVID-19 ICU patient <laughs> and the last one to leave. 105 days. It's a long time. Long time. His vocal cords are damaged. He's nearly 100 pounds lighter and much weaker, all after an ordeal that began back in mid-March. Phillips, who's a doctor, started noticing his symptoms after he and his husband, Matt Pettigrew, returned from a trip to the U.S. I started feeling dizzy and just not well. I don't remember anything about that from that point onwards. But Pettigrew, who also had COVID-19, remembers every agonizing detail. Phillips was put on a ventilator. The virus and subsequent infections attacked his lungs, heart, kidneys, and brain. Then he got severe pneumonia. When I thought I was saying goodbye to him at that point. I thought that might be the last time that I saw him alive. He was given a tracheotomy. Phillips started to rally, but Pettigrew knew he was struggling. I could see the look in his eyes that he was desperate and scared. I just want to see him. I want to hold him for a moment. On day 54, he got that visit. By day 67, he was breathing on his own. Not long after, his sense of humor returned too. Probably not hungry, but more thirsty. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there was a celebration when he left the ICU and later the hospital. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> At home, Pettigrew has tried to keep it light. But they think and too many the are still underestimating COVID-19. Philip says other than being slightly overweight and having high blood pressure, he was healthy before all of this. I will have permanent lung damage. How that will affect me, we don't know yet. Which is why he will keep working to get stronger and is urging others to see how serious this virus really is. Briar Stewart, CBC News. Vancouver. Wow. Okay, coming up, a Mi'kmaq artist got the news of a lifetime. Then the pandemic hit, so he wasn't able to share it. I had this news that I, knew that I wanted to tell my family and friends and my inner circle more than anything um, that was just on hold. Hey, but now he can share. That's next. Well, this is a painting called Veteran Elder by Mi'kmaq artist Nelson White. Back in February, he got some amazing news. The Smithsonian wanted to buy it. But then the world went into lockdown, the future of the deal uncertain, but now everything is finalized and he's able to share his story. It is our moment. I knew that the Smithsonian had accepted the artwork and they were going to, they were going to include it in their collection. Uh, it just everything stopped in the interim. They sort of said, I, I fit something they were looking for. They were trying to expand their collection of East Coast Indigenous artists, as well as uh, they were looking for more things to do with the military and with military service. And where Elder Ellsworth was also American, that also helped. So I think it all sort of just came together really well in one little package. It was uh, more frustrating because I had this news that I, knew, that I wanted to tell my family and friends and my inner circle more than anything. Um, that was just on hold. It's flattering. It's it's more a little surreal that it's in that place. Uh, I just was really concerned that Arrow had a good home. I wanted the artwork to go somewhere where it was going to be appreciated, where it was going to see be seen and have a long life. And I couldn't think of a better place for it to have a long life. Pretty exciting stuff. So uh, here's the thing. We don't know exactly where or when uh, the painting, uh, you know, will be put on display. But, but of course, that's TBA. And so that's exciting news to come. But it really goes to show you everyone's, everyone's put something on hold, right, during this pandemic. So here's to hoping the important stuff gets back on track. That's The National for this July 23rd. Have a great night.